Hello, protocols, packets, and programs. We continue the Cybersecurity Awareness Limerick Month with My browser used HTTPS, configured from an HSTS, but public Wi-Fi might have a bad guy who can break Diffie-Hellman, I guess? Which means this week we chat with Adrian Sanabria about InfoSec myths, mistakes, and misconceptions, along with a few ways to combat them. In the news segment, the top 10 gets its first update, Metasploit gets its first rewrite, PHP gets prepared statements, RSA Conference gets a lot of attention, and more. Charge your iPods and stay tuned for Application Security Weekly. This is a Security Weekly production for security professionals by security professionals. Please visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe to all the shows on our network. It's the show to learn the latest tools and techniques to understand DevOps, applications, and the cloud. Your trusted source for the latest AppSec news, it's time for Application Security Weekly. This is episode 279, recorded April 1st, 2004. I'm your host, Mike Shima. I'm here with Akira Brand. Hello, Akira. Hello. I feel like I should say a... uh limerick to go along with yours so i'm going to do so are you ready here we go bring it (laughs) there once was an app so bold whose security was quite cold with hackers in sight it put up no fight till patches its weakness strolled ah i love this oh yes applause many many rounds of applause for that akira that's amazing (laughs) please send me that we're gonna have to throw that up on the 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 show notes for everyone (laughs) John, unfortunately, missed it this week. I think he's fixing some technical issues in his 2.6 kernel with some Alsa sound drivers. Couple announcements. <laughs> to ensure that you don't lose access to the Security Weekly content you know and love, please make sure that you subscribe to your favorite RSS feeds on GeoCities, AOL, or anywhere else you listen to iPod broadcasts. Visit securityweekly.com slash subscribe to find subscription links for every show. Get ready for an electrifying experience at the 15th annual Identiverse. Join 3,000 plus identity professionals at the Aria Resort and Casino in Vegas on May 28th to 31st for four days packed with dynamic learning and collaboration. As a listener, receive 25% off your Identiverse tickets using the code IDV24-SW25. Register today at securityweekly.com slash IDV2024. Adrian is an outspoken researcher who doesn't shy away from uncomfortable truths. He loves to write about the security industry, tell stories, and still sees the glass as half full. Hello, Adrian. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, Always looking uh, forward to being a guest on on this show. Uh, This show's a lot of fun. I, I... I like how all the shows have kind of drifted and mm-hmm. like, uh, you know, have their own personalities and everything. And uh, you put a lot of love into those intros. I love them. I love the limericks. <laughs> Thank you so much. And you put a lot of love into keeping that glass half full. So we're going to go through some more myths. We talked with you last year about this. And um, we're going to see if we can maintain that optimism by the end. So just to kick things off, Adrian, maybe give us a taste of what exactly is an infosec myth. What what are what are what are one or two of them them sound like? Right. Yeah. So so there's different categories here. Uh, you know, there there are things that are, um, you know, just kind of common beliefs. You know, they're they're. Um, I'm trying to think. So so I recently just did a uh, a review on this book, uh, cybersecurity myths and myth. Myth, I almost said myth conceptions. <laughs> <laughs> Where do they come from? Because uh, so Vince Cerf actually does the the forward in this book, and he he suggested myth conceptions as the title of the book, but they didn't go with it. Um, but uh, but yeah, there's there's just kind of like the uh, and they they actually point this out. Uh, I forget what they call this this kind of yeah superstitions. You know, so you've got superstitions like uh, one of the examples they give is closing background apps on your phone to improve <laughs> performance. Actually does nothing, you know, but makes people feel like they're cleaning things mm-hmm. up and maybe releasing memory or something like that. Uh, and, and there are a lot of those, uh, you know, which is kind of a very different category from some of the fake statistics that we see marketing companies using, uh, things like that. You know, so some of them just kind of grow organically. Others are made up by people who do marketing and something sounds good. So they roll with it, even though it's not true. And then, um, 
some of them stem from misunderstandings. You know, we, we have uh, a lot of folks who don't have data science backgrounds, uh, have never taken a statistics class, and, and just misunderstand a graph or misunderstand some numbers and use them incorrectly. So there's kind of different categories of things here. All of them can be damaging. You know, some of them are, are fairly innocent, you know, like the juice jacking thing, you know, doesn't really <laughs> cause harm. You know, so we, we, we see the FBI, we see law enforcement talking about this. You know, there are no documented cases of juice jacking actually happening. Uh, in fact, most places you're going to charge your phones, uh, like there's no data connection uh, on those on those things to abuse in the first place. You know, it's it's just uh, if you look at a USB connector, uh, some of those pins are dedicated just for power delivery. And if you don't have any data pins, you can't get hacked over it, right? So, but it, it persists. Uh, a lot of these you'll see, once we point them out to you, you'll start seeing them everywhere. And, you know, sometimes you bring it up. Sometimes it's a hill worth dying on. And sometimes, you know, you just uh, kind of roll your eyes and move on. Yes. You well, battles. well, we're definitely taking half an hour to die on a couple of hills. So... <laughs> Stick with us, Adrian. And we'll find a few. We'll find a few. And, and I like that th that was a great introduction because on the one hand, you pointed out uh, swiping up to close a couple apps, probably harmless overall, unless someone out there listened to uh, our shows a couple uh, weeks ago about the uh, fingerprint reconstruction from the sound of swiping. But um, I'll come back to that in a second. But you also mentioned the juice jacking, which sounds scary. We've had FBI warnings about it. Like this is official. And one of the reasons I wanted to bring this topic up again is that a couple episodes back, I was talking about CPU attacks and saying, kind of dismissing them as like, these aren't the end of the world. You don't really have to worry. You have to worry about patching, as Akira reminds us in, in the lyrics. But she also asked me, well, how do you know orgs shouldn't worry about this? And no, we do want to avoid just an appeal to authority because I said so. It is really hard if we're looking at an authority like FBI that says juice jacking is terrible you're going to get hacked by it, but nobody does. So yeah. some of the things, though, I wanted to highlight is, as you already dove into on that example of, you know, the pins, like how, do, let, let's talk about like threat models and actually what would it take to be attacked in that way? Is this a huge dangerous thing where every USB, you know, port out there could potentially destroy your phone? Yeah, well, it's interesting because there are ways that USB can be dangerous. Uh, there are actually companies out there that make devices mm -hmm. that will um, uh, have capacitors on board and will use the power from a USB port to charge those capacitors and then send back like a damaging level of, uh, of electricity, uh, you know, with, with intent to do damage, right? Like these devices are typically made to, to test uh, protection against uh, spikes in power and things like that. Like, uh, I don't know about other Mac uh, uh, laptops, but MacBooks actually have protection against this. And wh what they'll do is they'll just shut down the USB port. So if you've ever had a MacBook and the USB port just stops working all of a sudden, uh, that means it's detected a spike, it's shut itself down. And you, it, even like a software reboot, I don't think resets it. You have to completely power off and turn it back on and your USB port will be fine. You know, it's basically... Uh, like resetting a breaker or or replacing a fuse, yeah, uh, and it, it, it'll automatically reset itself. And, and that's a good point because you know there's companies out there like Hack Five has the OMG cables. I think you're kind of alluding to as well. So it, it is these types of attacks are possible, but pulling off these attacks, you know, at scale or at random places, that's the difference. And I think that's kind of the distinction we would take to tackle a myth like that. Um, we only have 30 minutes, so I do want to jump on a yeah. couple other myths. Um, last year, we talked about um, a presentation that you had prepped for um, uh, the EnigmaConf. And you had mentioned yeah. that, you know, one of the myths about breaches killing companies. Um, in the yeah. last year, how many companies got killed by a breach? Uh, I, I think it was maybe, I think it was maybe one, maybe less than one. Um, so, and that's typically the average. Mm -hmm. uh, it's typically what we see is, is maybe one to two each year. Uh, they're all small companies. Uh, these days, it tends to be ransomware that does it. Uh, you know, but uh, yeah, it, it remains a, a pretty stable uh, conclusion that companies just don't go out of business because of uh, uh, cybersecurity incidents. It's just, it's very rare. It does happen. And I've, I've studied and collected uh, a list of all those that have happened. So if you do a do a search on the internet for destroyed by breach, 
you'll find a Google spreadsheet, and that's my Google spreadsheet. And one of my one of my goals here, it was a goal last year. I just didn't didn't uh, finish it yet. I'm setting up a website that's a more permanent spot for all all that research to live. Uh, something a little more formal than a Google spreadsheet. Yeah. Uh, something that people can link to. Uh, a lot of people will link to that Enigma talk, which is up on YouTube. Uh, it's pretty mm-hmm. easy to find if if you look for myths and lies in infosec on on YouTube. You'll find uh, two or three versions of that talk. Uh, I gave it at a, a few other conferences as well, but it's um, <clears throat> yeah, it's it's uh, uh, rare when it happens, but it does tend to be small companies and ransomware these days when it does. And it, it is important to pay attention to because ransomware does ransomware is a legitimate threat, right? But I think part of what comes, what makes that a myth is I is that comes out of like marketing that comes out of the lead by fear to sell so and so AppSec yeah. InfoSec tools. Use our and product, or yeah, your exactly. company may die. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, Adrian, what, when you say small companies, how small is small? So the largest on the list was had four hundred and fifty employees. Uh, okay. There was another one with uh, four hundred, another one three three fifty. Uh, I, I'd say 75% of the list uh, had 30 or less employees. Fascinating. Okay, I have more follow-up questions, but let's continue on so I don't derail yeah. us completely. <laughs> we'll see. Well, staying on the rails, this is, well, what are you thinking, Akira? We never do that. <laughs> but, um, so Adrian, so we talked about like that that sort of appeal to authority, that, that stemmed from marketing. I want to find, just kind of talk about a couple other sources and maybe touch on a little bit of hyperbole. And here I want to mention artificial intelligence. So we've seen like AI is going to make security worse or it's going to make phishing worse. And here's an example. I wonder, maybe there are grains of truth, but uh, maybe I gave away the, yeah. the the game here by saying hyperbole. What are some, what, what are these types of myths that you've seen or that you'd like to maybe break apart a little bit that have that grain of truth, but that grain of truth is being over complicated. It's being, you know, it, it, it doesn't have a good threat model behind it. Yeah. So, you know, I think when something's as hyped as AI is, you know, the tendency is, is to believe that there's going to be some, some massive sudden change, you know, that, that, uh, you know, all these layoffs uh, that have been happening could be somehow linked to it or something like that. You know, and the reality is usually, like it's still going to be big with AI, but it's going to be more gradual, um, you know, and, and less doomsday-ish, you know, than, than some of the hype would, would lead you to believe. Uh, certainly, I, I think on both sides with AI, we're going to see productivity increases. You know, we're not going to see AI replace people. We're going to see people who know how to use AI strategically and, and in a way that increases their productivity replace people who don't know, don't have those same skills. You know, I mean, this is the new Microsoft Office, right? Like someone who knows how to use a spreadsheet and someone who doesn't, one of those employees is going to be more valuable. And, you know, it it, it works on the attacker side as well. You know, I think Mm -hmm. my main concern when ChatGPT first came out is, you know, already we see so many ransomware attacks and we see so much damage from it. Uh, I was worried that, the small parts of those attacks that are still manual, you know, like negotiating uh, the ransom, oh. you know, now that's something that's something in a large language model could could take over, you know. So if they're able to fully automate these things, could they get some kind of a, a 10x improvement out of out of attacks? Because traditionally, we've seen uh, attackers are really uh, they they have a a skill shortage in, in terms of the amount of available low hanging fruit out there. Uh, in in the case with uh, the big case with Uber, uh, where Joe Sullivan was on on trial, uh, one of the things we learned from that was that the attackers that hit Uber uh, actually got access to hundreds and hundreds of other companies in the course of doing that, and only targeted Uber because they took all the credentials that they managed to. Uh, working credentials, working GitHub credentials that they managed to get out of that process uh, and sorted it by most popular website. So basically took like the Alexa top 1 million, uh, you know, did a join on it and and did a sort and Uber came out on top. So they attacked Uber, but they had hundreds and hundreds of, could have helped them. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) They had hundreds and hundreds of other companies that they just didn't have the time or resources to target. 
So my concern is always, you know, wh- when their technology gets to the point to where they can actually take advantage of 100% of those those resources, that that's that's what gets me worried here. And that's a good, I, I like that approach because actually you pleasantly surprised me on that one by pointing out the, the scaling or what, what, what parts of an attack doesn't mm-hmm. scale. Because my, my approach when talking about AI and phishing, a little bit different from ransomware perhaps, is just the idea that the countermeasures to phishing aren't being, aren't looking for typos, aren't inspecting the URL. We had EV certs for a while, you know, to turn your nav bar green, that this is potentially not the real site or a different site, and nobody paid attention to it. You know, it wasn't effective against a, as a phishing countermeasure. The real countermeasure is FIDO2 type of authentication, strong authentication against credential-based attacks. Whereas, we'll go back to patching, is one of those big defenses against ransomware. That's what small companies are struggling with. And so this is where I, I see there, there can be grains of truth, but the, the distinction between the attack and what's making things worse and what we actually should be doing to counter that attack aren't always mapping one-to-one, it feels like. Yeah, and you, you're kind of nicely taking us uh, into one of the most damaging myths, and, and it's that that users are somehow the problem. You know, that, you. that uh, I, we, we, we know what humans are likely to do. You know, we know some percentage of our employees are going to fail, you know, yet we throw all this money and, and effort onto awareness training and phishing training and stuff like that. Somebody's always going to be the new person who hasn't gone through that training yet, right? You know, and, mm. you know, we know we can't drive that to zero percent. So we need to uh, plan on some of those people failing and, and look at what those next steps look like. You know, where further down the attack chain can we can we stop that attack? Because we know some of that's going to fail instead of writing people up because they failed the phishing test or even firing people because they, they failed too many uh, phishing tests, which is just I, I can't imagine the fear people must have at these companies even opening an email. And so studies have been done on this. There's a big study, I think it was in Austria or Germany, on 14,000 people where they found that security awareness uh, programs, uh, certainly when done incorrectly, there's a lot of nuance to it, have a net negative effect. You know, it actually uh, uh, statistically hurt productivity, noticeably hurt productivity. Uh, it, it basically just train people to not open emails anymore, you know, not, not to do their job, not to click on links. Uh, and the opposite is what we need to be doing. You know, we, we need to just work with the flaws that humans already have and give them the confidence to never question clicking a link. You know, they, they should, yes. they should be able to click good links and bad links, you know, and, and, uh, you know, we, we should have a plan to handle either. And that brings up, I want to tie in two slogans that always bug me. One is like the humans are the weakest link. You're pointing out, well, how come we didn't have better But we already knew that, so why didn't you plan for and, it? Yeah, exactly. Why, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Why, why is this a surprise? And, and who else uses computers? It's not like, if we're not designing computers for humans to use, then why are we bothering? Yeah. And kind of a, similar to that, that touches on what you were mentioning too, is that idea that attackers just not, need to be right once, defenders need to be right all the time. Yep. Well, you know what, what? What do you hear when somebody says that? Yeah, I, I mean that that's a very uh, limited perspective. You know, when you have the whole picture, you know, if 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 you do, uh, Kelly Shortridge has this amazing tool mm-hmm. called Deciduous, where you can you can create decision trees and you can kind of map things out uh, visually. And and when you have that kind of full picture from both the attacker and the defender side, and you look at things like honey tokens and honey pots and things like that you can really have, uh, you, you know, a, a lot of alarms, a lot of sensors and things like that set up to, to make it a nightmare for an attacker the moment they get in. So, sh- you know, you can totally flip that around and say, uh, defenders don't need to detect everything an attacker does. They only need, you know, one alarm tripped uh, to discover an attacker. So the attacker has to get it right now every time. The moment they... Uh, get into an organization or an environment that's unknown ground for them. They're flying blind. You know, cloud of war uh, applies here, and uh, and and they're in a minefield, and and they have to consider their next steps very carefully. You know, is the file server they're going after a real file server, or you know, are, are those just a bunch of honey tokens and you know placed on a honey on a honey pot? 
So there's all kinds of stuff or the credentials they're using. Is that a real employee or a fake employee that's been placed there, you know, that they were intended to grab and, and to use? So because we control these environments, you know, we can make it very, very difficult on them because they have to assume the environment they're getting into when they get there. They have to assume things, everything is real that they're looking at. Nothing's a trap. Nothing's fake. Uh, or if, if they're aware of traps existing, that's going to really slow them down, if not make them choose a different target altogether. Indeed. And even even setting aside like all those canary tokens, shout out to Thinks, for example, as um, you know, there's just that logging and monitoring. One of the nuances that has to come up here, though, is a lot of those small businesses, for example, getting hit with ransomware probably don't have as much of the the budget and the sophistication to have that maturity of pervasive logging, analysis of what's going on in their network. And so that's where the reality becomes hard. And I'm I guess I, I'm more just, that's, I guess, more of a comment than a question at, well, at this point. You know, how, how does, how, how do we help uh, in, as an industry that with that? So, so, yeah, we've actually seen, so Mandiant has tracked dwell time for a long time. And I, mm -hmm. I, I'd argue, mm -hmm. so dwell time was defined as the amount of time it would take uh, a defender to discover an attack. Uh, and, and I would argue dwell time doesn't really exist anymore. It's more notification time. It's how long mm -hmm. does the attacker wait before mm -hmm. sending the ransom note? And that's how, uh, and, and that's why we've seen that time dramatically drop from like hundreds of days to like less than a week. You know, I, I don't know where the mm -hmm. average time is at this point, but the reason it dropped that much is because the attacker has an incentive to tell them that they've been attacked. And in fact, uh, they now have incentive to tell the SEC that they've been attacked <laughs> right. if they if they haven't uh, notified the SEC and the required <laughs> amount of time you know <laughs> they the will Mark attack. Levine everything is securities fraud <laughs> trap yes exactly yeah Adrian how do you feel about especially in the case of small companies the pervasive I would call it a myth um of that to have a good security posture you have to spend a lot of money mm hmm. Yeah, I, so I've done a lot of research into failures and breaches. You know, that's that's kind of my one of my main areas of of uh, research. And I, I've I don't think I've ever had a case where you know I looked at the post mortem, went through the post mortem, and thought ah, they didn't have enough products. You know, <laughs> they just needed they needed more more vendors up in here. You know. Uh, <laughs> Because typically, you know, what that leads to is that leads to overhead and small businesses don't have people to manage that. You know, so oftentimes they're, defend they're depending on MSSPs, on MDR firms, you know, they're outsourcing that, that job of a security program. And, you know, even there, we should have ways to test how effective these, these vendors and these services are. So I feel like uh, on the one hand, we need a lot more information about how good products are, you know, about how our dollars spent uh, actually return in efficacy and reduction in risk uh, that just doesn't exist today. You know, it's, it's just guesswork and, and crossed fingers today. And on, on the other hand, the other thing I find going through these cases is that the stuff they did have was all misconfigured. You know, like, like there's a bunch of stuff just built into Microsoft 365 and Google Workspace and, and people don't use it. They don't know it's there. You know, so they don't turn it on. So there, there's you know, security. Ultimately, the whole security industry is kind of filling a gap, right? You know, that where a lot of these security controls should exist in products. And for a lot of small businesses, they don't really have to go out and buy anything extra. You know, it really should. And this is both kind of an idealism perspective should be built into the into Google Workspace and, and Microsoft 365. But in a lot of cases, it is, you know, everything you need really is there. You know, if you've got a basic uh, SaaS first, cloud first company, you don't own any physical infrastructure, you don't have any server, you know, workloads running anywhere. Uh, really, most of what you need is already there. and you know, people just don't, companies don't have the expertise to turn it all on, to configure it, to make it work. And that's, we, last episode, actually, we talked about, um, with, with uh, Benedict Gaggi, about user experience, the, the UX aspect of security and just in general. And it ties into a little bit of what you mentioned, you know, blaming the user, what you're just describing now of, why don't we have those 
better secure defaults? You know, what? Yeah. Where is? And here's where I kind of want to turn the the, the conversation to. You know, let, let, let's fill up that glass for you. You know, what is? How, how do we battle more of these myths? What can we do different? What What should we do in response to myths like this? Yeah, so so I, I think that's a really important job. It, it's something I've urged vendors uh, to do a lot is, is to actually track the efficacy of their products with their customers. You know, like for example, uh, vulnerability management vendors. I tell them to track how often somebody exports uh, the data it, it, out of the product, right? Because typically, if you're exporting the data out of the product, it's because the product's not doing something that you need it to do. You know, so you're going to export it to Excel or you're going to throw it in a database, uh, you know, because you can't do the query, you can't do the filtering that you need within the application itself. So, I, I you know, I think uh, things like that are, uh, you know, product teams should measure that kind of stuff. Uh, they should be aware of whether or not their uh, customers are even using their product. In a lot of cases, they can see it's never been turned on. It's never been deployed. Um, security is it, it's a weird space. You know, I often compare it to consumer apps. If if I build a one dollar app and try to sell it and it doesn't work, I know immediately I will have one star reviews for days, right? And but if I build a million dollar security product, uh, yeah, I could sell that to a hundred companies. All one hundred of those companies never turn it on, and I could have a good exit somewhere. Like like literally, you could build a product that doesn't work and have a good exit. In, in this industry. And it's just because there's not enough exposure, not, not enough, enough transparency. Uh, and this is why I tried to build product reviews uh, for, for cybersecurity products, which is, which is really difficult to do them well. And, uh, you know, continue looking for ways to do that. You know, where you really need a team to do it. You got to figure out how to monetize it. But, um, but most of the way people figure that out is they just ask their coworkers and their peers. You know, hey, have you used this product? Is this any good? Yeah, and that's you're. I think highlighting as well that AppSec, InfoSec in general, still remains so much more art than science, which yeah. has the necessity or the implication that is that relying on peer references is relying on how did you that subjectivity of how did you feel using this? Did this solve your problem? How did it make or not? you feel? <laughs> How did it make you feel? Yeah, exactly. And maybe that's all our security awareness training well, needs to be. And, and it, it's so funny anecdote there is uh, I remember uh, reading Daniel Miso's newsletter and uh, rabbit hole he went down was the etymology of the word security. If you take it back to its Latin, Latin roots, it means uh, without worry, basically. You know, so, so it very much is, you know, the etymology of the word security. And I think in many cases for a lot of companies, it is a feeling. It's, it's a feeling of confidence, of comfort, you know, your comfort level with where you are. And yeah, that could be a false sense of comfort. You know, you, you can have a false sense of security. I think a lot of companies do when they get hacked. They're, they're very surprised by it. Other companies are a little bit better with that. And they, they understand their chances of getting hacked and they're less surprised and they're more prepared. So I'm wondering then, maybe just sort of without naming vendors, you know, in particular, you know, what what can especially small companies do? And perhaps there's a start of the well, there's patching, and I don't know how many vendors are out there that actually helps you patch yeah. all the things you've got, um, as well as you describe the the defaults for like Microsoft, you know, O365, the Google Workspace. That's direct from the just default security yep. from the vendors themselves. I will throw in that, um, you know, one of my favorite topics like FIDO keys, like, you know, hardware tokens for strong authentication. Those are phishing resistance. They're, they're you know, resistant to spoofing, reuse, et cetera. That's the type of vendor and implementation I would be favorable towards. Is there something that you have a short list for a, 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 a vendor category or, or solution category that you kind of nudge people towards? Or does it just turn into it depends? I mean, a lot of it does sit at those Microsoft 365, uh, you know, Google Workspace. Uh, you know, that, that's really the core of a business, you know, where all your files are, all your emails are, your, your calendars and things like that. Uh, and and you know, I would urge folks before you buy another product, you know, be aware of everything you're already paying for, you know, and be aware of whether or not you're utilizing all of it or not. Um, but uh, yeah, security creep. Keys is, is, a, is a great one. Uh, you know, user permissions is another big one. 
you know, oftentimes it's, it's easy just to give the new employee access to everything, you know, but if you spend that extra five, 10 minutes, every time you onboard a new employee to say, okay, what do they actually need access to, you know, or just let them ask for access as they go, instead of defaulting to giving them all the permissions, you're reducing a huge amount of attack surface. Then when inevitably one of those new employees gets fished, uh, you know, that you've really limited the, the amount of damage uh, that an attacker could do with, with that level of privileges. Um, you know, I think deception is another big one. You know, there's, there's a lot of free ways, uh, canarytokens.org, you know, there, there's, mm-hmm. uh, um, you know, free, uh, free honeypot, uh, pro, uh, open source out there. Uh, you know, and, and that's something you can spend a day deploying some of these, these traps, putting them in different places. And, uh, you know, when you get the alarm, you get the alarm, you know, you know, that something's, something weird is going on in, in a spot and you can go and investigate it. Uh, and it's, it's very low effort, very low cost. Uh, you know, but certainly I think the number one thing is, is being aware of what you're already paying for and like using the most of what Google workspace and Microsoft 365 can, can do for you. Take some training classes there, you know, learn how to, how to configure and secure these things. And that's going to go the longest way. I think for, for a small business, a small company, a startup, uh, particularly. So as we're looking ahead to, to the next year, or the next decade, are there any myths that you see starting to, to smolder and come up that you want to try and, and tamp down before they become too pervasive? Um, I mean, AI is, is definitely starting to have its own mm-hmm. myths. And, and I think the number one way we can combat some of those myths is just by using the, the product. You know, so so one of the ideas, uh, so the the talk, me and Akira were at the same conference, the uh, uh, Isaka South Florida annual conference, the called Wow, and what I was focusing on there is having more early adopters uh, and innovators in security. Uh, so I called them cybersecurity scouts, people that will go try out new products, and you know, a, a lot of it's oh, I read about this, I heard this or that, and that's where the myths start. You know, that's that's where the the misunderstanding starts is, uh, you know, I I heard this is garbage. Like I asked it about myself and, you know, it said I was the head of the CIA or something like that, you know, and 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 sure, you know, you can make uh, AI look very dumb. You know, if if you ask it to do something, it's really bad at doing, you know, but that's that's kind of selling it short and uh you got to use products. So we need cybersecurity scouts. We need people who adopt this technology early you know, and set the, you know, use that experience to set the record straight to say, no, so there are problems. Here's the actual problems, you know, instead of the perceived problems, which tend to, you know, establish the myths and go off in the wrong direction. Ah, dealing with actual problems, if only. Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm a fan of Dune, so I personally am just waiting for the Butlerian Jihad. So that, that'll be the fun way to take care of this. Uh, we, but uh, got a, another couple thousand years, right, before that happens. Got to prepare. Um, Adrian, we have been asking all of our uh, guests this year uh, a new type of question to, to, as, we, as we start to wrap up every segment. And this is building the yearbook, if you will, and help us fill in this phrase. AppSec is most likely to what? Unintentionally embrace chaos engineering. Unintentionally. Ooh, that's, an inter- that's a fun nuance. I, so I like this. Oh, man. Okay, we're going to have to have you back just to talk about, the, you know, the, this answer in detail. So stick around for, you know, the next year and we'll 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 bring you in somehow trying to figure out how to just basically <laughs> say thank you for helping us talk about this already with InfoSec Myths. This has been really fun. Yeah, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. So, and as I was stumblingly attempting to say, we're going to have to have you back because it sounds like there's a lot of more fun topics that uh, we can have some more chats like this about. So thank you again, Adrian. Thank you, Akira. Thank you everyone else for listening. We're going to take a quick break now and return with news of the week. 